So uh, Genesis 49, 29. Then he commanded them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, to the east of Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abram bought with, a field, with the field from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. Then they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife, and there they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife, and there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is in it were bought from the Hittites. When Jacob finished commanding his sons, he drew up his feet into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. Then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants to the physicians to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for it, and that is how many required for embalming. And the Egyptians, Egyptians wept for him seventy days. When the days of weeping for, for him were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found favor in your eyes, please speak in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, I am about to die in my tomb that I hewed out for myself in the land of Canaan. There you shall bury me. Now, therefore, let me please go up and bury my father, then I will return. And Pharaoh answered, Go up and bury your father as he made you swear. So Joseph went up to bury his father. With him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his household, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as all the household of Joseph, his brothers, and his father's household. Only their children, their flocks, and their herds were left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen. It was a very great company. When they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, they lamented there with a very great and grievous lamentation, and he, and he made a mourning for his father seven days. When the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning, mourning on the threshing floor of Atad, they said, This is a grievous mourning by the Egyptians. Therefore the place is called Abel Mizraim. It is beyond the Jordan. Thus his sons did for him as he had commanded them. For his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of, of Machpelah to the east of Mamre, which Abraham bought with, a, with the field from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. After he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. This is the word of our Lord. Please be seated. And let's pray again together. Heavenly Father, as we approach this passage of Scripture this morning, we do so with a holy confidence, confident that you are the God who keeps his promises. Lord, you are the God who kept his promises to Jacob. And you are the God who keeps his promises to us. And Lord, you have promised that when your word goes out, you will accomplish that for which you sent it. And so, Lord, we are also reliant on this promise this morning, that you would work in the hearts of all who are assembled here, to all who are hearing this message from your word, and we pray that you would work in every heart. Lord, we ask that you would have mercy and that you would cause those who, who are facing death as Christians to do so with renewed confidence and you, faithful God, and for those who are here as unbelievers this morning, we pray that you would accomplish salvation through the work of your Spirit in their hearts as well. We ask that you would grant repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. We pray this for your glory and for the building of your church. Amen. Death is all around us. But people try to comfort themselves saying that death is natural. But it's not. Death is an enemy. I'm reminded of that fact whenever I visit someone in the hospital for whom death is imminent. Even at a relatively young age, I am beginning to experience the effects of death. 
as I begin to, to feel my body beginning to, to fall apart. Death is an enemy. We live in a fallen world because sin entered the world in Genesis 3. All mankind was cursed to die. Death is all around us. This afternoon, I am going to a funeral for the mother of one of our neighbors. Yesterday, I saw three notifications on Facebook reminding me of death. But praise God with these three that, that all were Christians. The, the first is that the fact that this is the third anniversary of the death of, of Gianna Bartolucci, a teenage girl who, who was killed by a drunk driver. She died three years ago yesterday. Her father is a, a pastor in fire, part of the, the fellowship that, that this church is a part of. Josh, you might remember seeing him at, at the conference, still grieving over the loss of his daughter. It's just, only three years is, is a short time when we think about these things. And, and I, I was in, in contact with Tony yesterday and, and um, I, I said that I would, would pray for him. So I want to just stop for a moment and, and pray for, for Tony Bartolucci and for his wife Lois. Heavenly Father, we praise you for the life of Gianna. We thank you, Lord, that even at the age of 15, that she had a real and vital relationship with you, that, that she was bearing fruit and keeping of, repent, of repentance, Lord, that, that she was indeed your child. And Lord, we thank you for the Bartolucci family. We, we thank you for their faithfulness in the gospel. We thank you, Lord, that even in the midst of profound grief, Lord, you are comforting them. And we pray, Lord, for, for renewed co comfort as they have gathered together with the saints this morning, that they would experience the comfort of the church as the church is, is your hands and your feet and your mouth to, to serve them in the gospel. Lord, we thank you for this privilege that, that we have. Most of us have never met Tony. I've only met him very briefly. But Lord, I, I pray that you would um, bring new and refreshed encouragement to him and to Lois this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yesterday was also the 23rd anniversary of, of the death of, of Luke Middleton one of, of my first friends when I moved to Australia. And Luke was also killed by a drunk driver. He was only 24. And Luke's mom wrote a post about it on, on Facebook, and I was thankful to be able to, to connect with her. And, and she, she is, 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 is also a, a believer and, and has a, a real hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and in, in, in being reunited with her son together before the Lord. The third post was about the fourth anniversary of the death of Elizabeth Elliot. All three deaths on the same day. If you're not familiar with Elizabeth Elliot, I really would encourage you to, to pick up one of her books and, and to read it. She was the wife of Jim Elliot, who was martyred by the Hurani people of Ecuador in 1956. Um, Jim, Jim had once famously said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Jim Elliot fully experienced the reality and the full truth of that statement on that day in 1956. But for Elizabeth, it would be almost 60 years before she would fully experience it. But she lived her life in light of that fact, in light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, in light of the comfort that she was serving a sovereign and wise and loving God. She lived her whole life with that thought in the forefront of her mind. And she wrote in her book, Shadow of the Almighty, which I heartily recommend, is the distinction between living for Christ and dying for Him so great is not the second, the logical conclusion of the first. Elizabeth Elliot found meaning in death 
and meaning in life as she interpreted the death of her husband in light of the cross. The same is true for Gianna's parents. Gianna's father wrote this poem after her death. High hopes had we for your recovery, a 15th surgery, but it was not to be. To our great dismay, God took you away, leaving us in disarray, waiting for that day. A day in eternity, our great hope, our plea, again your face to see, worshiping him who set us free. In this poem, Tony expresses the father's grief over the death of his precious daughter, his only child, but it is grief that is mixed with faith. The same is true for Luke's family. Luke's parents turned back to Christ after Luke's death. And Luke's sister was saved a year later. And I've had many conversations with Luke's family about his death, and they all pointed to Christ. And even as I was seeking to be an encouragement to them and to remind them of the gospel, they were doing that for me. It was amazing to see their faith grow. In fact, Luke's dad had a hand in introducing me to the doctrines of grace and to biblical counseling, both of which helped, have helped me immensely. And have helped them in the, in, in the aftermath of Luke's death, and they continue to help them. But friends, if, if the Lord tarries, all of us will face death in the future, either the death of a loved one or your own death. Are you prepared? Are you prepared? Gianna did not expect on that, that night just before Christmas as they were go, she was going to get a Christmas tree with her dad. She didn't expect to be, to be, for their car to be hit by a drunk driver. And then six months later to, to be entering eternity. She was 15. Luke was on the way home from dinner with his dad and his, his mom actually heard the sirens of, of the ambulance that, that, took, that took her, body's li her, her son's lifeless body to the morgue. It was less than a kilometer from home. They didn't go out that night expecting to die. None of us expect to die in the, in the immediate future. For some, people like Jack, who I visited in the hospital, or Elizabeth Elliot, they, they knew they were unwell for a while. They, they knew that, that probably before too long that, that they would lead this life and go to be with the Lord. They had an opportunity to prepare. One of the most important jobs I have as a pastor is to help you to prepare for death. For the death of loved ones and for your own death. And this morning, you are being given an opportunity to prepare as we look at this passage from Genesis 49 and into chapter 50. This is your opportunity. So, so how do you prepare for death? The scriptures teach us a great deal about death. And this morning, we're going to see this in the death of Jacob. Jacob's is the, the longest deathbed scene in the scriptures. It goes from the end of chapter 47 to the end of chapter 49. And then in the first half of, of chapter 50, we have a description of his funeral procession. We had already looked at Jacob's command to Joseph at the end of, of chapter 37, not to bury him in Egypt, but to bury him with his fathers in their tomb. This command is going to figure prominently in our passage this morning. We've already looked at the blessings that, that Jacob pronounced on his sons from chapter 48.1 to 49.28. Blessings that were pronounced in faith. Blessings that would have profound ramifications for the nation of Israel and for us. Blessings that are grounded in God's covenant promises of an offspring and a land, promises that have been given to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob and were now bequeathed to God's chosen people to elect Israel and through them to elect Gentiles, to you and to me. Abraham is described as a wandering Aramean in Deuteronomy. But I think Jacob can be described as, as even more of a wanderer. Abram had traveled from Haran to Canaan. And Jacob went from Canaan to Haran, and he lived there for 20 years. 
And after Abraham was called in Haran, he spent very little time outside of the promised land. He went down to Egypt twice on brief forays for food. When Jacob left the promised land for Egypt, he lived there for 17 years. It's where his life would end. It is at the end of these 17 years that we pick up the narrative. As Jacob's life draws to a close, so does Genesis. Jacob is about to take his final journey, but it's also his greatest journey. It's his journey into the promised land. Jacob faced a lot of suffering and grief in his 147 years. More than once, his own sin and his scheming wreaked havoc in his life and in the lives of his family. Jacob had wrestled with the Lord and with man, but the Lord had prevailed over it all. And now Jacob is about to leave this life and to enter the presence of the Lord. Jacob knows that death is imminent, so he makes final preparations. He, he has gathered his sons around, and after pronouncing these oracles on him from the, the earlier in chapter, in chapter 48 and, and first part of 49, Jacob gives them very clear instructions here in, in uh, chapter 49, verses 29 to 33. So let's listen to Jacob's last words. Again, Jacob's prepared for his death. He's, he's already made Joseph swear an oath not to bury him in Egypt, but to take his body out and bury him with his fathers in Genesis 40, 47, verses 29 and 30. And now Jacob explains further. Again, all of his sons are gathered together. And so Jacob tells them that he is about to be gathered to his people. Now, some would say that being gathered to his people simply is a euphemism for death or, or being buried in the family plot, since Jacob does go on to make explicit, an explicit request of where he is to be buried. But I don't believe that's correct. Ishmael was also said to be gathered to his people in Genesis 25, 17, but he was not buried in the same place. And Ishmael, it seems, from Romans 9 verses 6 to 9 is, is not in heaven. Please turn with me there to, to Romans chapter 9. Verses 6 to 9. Specifically, here we look at verse 7. Not all the children of Abraham, not all are the children of Abraham, because they are his offspring, for through Isaac your offspring shall be named. This is a, an oblique reference to Ishmael. The blessing doesn't come through Ishmael, it comes through Isaac. Ishmael is, a, is an illustration of reprobation of those who are not among the children of promise. And Paul goes on here to, to use Esau, Jacob's brother, as an illustration. Esau was rejected by God, hated by God, we're told in Romans 9.13. But Jacob, however, was chosen by God's electing grace. So when Jacob was gathered to his people as one of the children of promise, he was gathered as one who had faith. James Boyce explains that Jacob died in faith and was gathered with the people who had died in faith earlier. And Boyce explains also that, that it's not, this is not merely an, an, a deathbed faith. This is a life-transforming orientation of those who have learned the passing nature of this life and the overriding performance and importance of the life to come. Signor Gadanis says it similarly, that Jacob died in hope and was buried in the promised land in hope, hope that God would fulfill his promise of a homeland for his people. Abraham had been gathered to, to his people, Genesis 25, 8. Isaac had been gathered to his people, Genesis 35, 29. Now Jacob was about to be gathered to his people. Jacob gives very clear instructions. He wants to be buried in the cave in the field of Ephron the Hittite, the cave in the field that was at Machpelah in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. This is very explicit. There can be no doubt as to the exact location. This is clearly the field that Abraham bought in Genesis 23 to bury Sarah, as Jacob says here. 
Back in Genesis 23, verses 17 to 20, we, we have a very clear property deed that includes location, the parties involved, and witnesses. It was a formal record that the cave in Machpelah and the field and the trees of the field belonged as, as they belonged to Abraham's family. This was the family's first foothold in the land promised to them by the Lord. First to Abraham. And then to Isaac, and then to Jacob. Abraham and Sarah were buried there. Isaac and Rebekah were buried there. Now we find out that this is also where, where Jacob is about, uh, had buried Leah, and he is going to be next. Again, this speaks of, of Jacob's faith, faith that God would fulfill his promise to give his people a land of their own. The family plot was symbolic of the fulfillment of a much greater promise. So in verse 33, when Jacob finished commanding his sons, he drew up his feet into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. He calmly lay back on his bed and entered eternity. Calvin remarked, We shall not deem it grievous to leave this failing tabernacle when we reflect on the everlasting abode which is prepared for us. In that moment, as Jacob le left this life, his faith was made sight. He received what the Lord had promised, or most of what the Lord had promised. One day, if the Lord tarries, you also will breathe your last. One day, maybe sooner than you think, you will leave this life. You will be gathered to your people. Ishmael was gathered to his people, but they were a different people. Ishmael's people are not God's people. Esau's people are not God's people. It is the elect according to the promise of God who are God's people. They are the true children of God. If you are here as a Christian this morning, you are a child of God. And God has promised that he would gather people from every tribe and tongue and nation. You are the people of God. This is a question that, that, that we all need to ask ourselves. So am, am I a child of God? Am I a child of God? Will, will I be gathered to the people of God? Will I be in that number when the saints go marching in? Will, will I be in that number when they gather around the throne? This is a vitally important question that we all need to ask ourselves. We're, we're told in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 to examine ourselves to make sure that we are in the faith. Examine yourself. Look for, look for the the evidence, the fruit of regeneration, the fruit of repentance in your life, the, the fruit of your spirit. And again, not, not in, the, in the, the moments of life, in those, those times that, that we will all sin, but in the trajectory of your life, in the big picture, are you moving Christward? Or are you moving towards the world? Next in chapter 50, verses 1 to 3, we see Jacob's embalming in Egypt. Now Joseph once again becomes the principal actor. His presence here at his father's deathbed is fulfillment of God's promise that Joseph would be there as the one who would close his father's eyes. And jo Jacob's, or so Joseph's deep love and depth of grief for his father is described when he, is, he, he falls upon his father's lifeless body, weeping and, and kissing him. Joseph has been described as the weeping patriarch, and most of his tears in Genesis have been tears of joy as, as he was reunited with his brothers. These are tears of powerful grief. Joseph grieves. He grieves deeply, but not like those who have no hope. We grieve too when, when our loved ones die, but when our, our loved ones die in faith and we look at their life through the eyes of of faith, we, we who are left behind grieve, but with hope. With hope. Look, please turn with, your, with me in your Bible to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses um, 13 and 14.
But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. And then Paul goes on to, to explain uh, what's going to happen at the last trumpet when, when Christ calls all of his home and, into, into, and we go to be with Jesus forever, with, with all of God's people with our brothers and sisters from, from all around the world and throughout history. This blessed reunion that we have with loved ones who have gone before, but especially this blessed reunion that we have with Christ. Now, Joseph didn't understand this as fully as we do, living as we do after the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But Joseph's hope was essentially the same as ours. Joseph's faith was the same as ours. Joseph anticipated that, that somehow that God was going to redeem him. Joseph was saved by the same gospel that you and I are saved by, but it was in shadows and types. We now understand more fully than he could. Then Joseph acts again. He has, he has Jacob embalmed by the physicians. This was the process of mummification. When we were in the British Museum a, a few weeks ago, there, there's several mummies there it's, that, that had come out of Egypt. In a mummification, the internal organs are removed and stored in jars, and, and the body is, is wrapped in linen bandages. But it's interesting here that, it, that the fish, physicians are those who are described as performing the mummification. Because in Egypt, this process was usually a priestly function, not performed by, by physicians. It was a religious rite. And so several commentators theorized that Joseph wanted to distance the mummification of Jacob from the beliefs of the Egyptian religion. The Egyptians were, were very careful about the body of, this, of the deceased, but misguidedly. They had no understanding of the resurrection of the dead to eternal life with Christ or eternal death separated from him. But now notice that it's the name of, of Israel is, is used, seeming to highlight the importance of the one who had died. And there, there were 40 days assigned to the embalming process, and then there's another 30 days of national mourning for Israel. 70 days in total. Almost identical, Von Rad points out, to the 72 days of mourning that are required for, for in Egypt for a pharaoh. So what's being said here is, is this is magnifying the, the importance of Jacob. He was an important figure, even in the land of Egypt. And one day, if the Lord tarries, people are going to remember you. How are they going to remember you? What will they say of you? You have the opportunity to prepare for that day now. You have a, the opportunity to, opportunity to affect that now. You're the, the life you live in the present will determine how others remember you in the future. But it's not the verdict of other people that matters most. Far from it. What matters is, is what will God say of you? Will he say to you, well done, good and faithful servant, you have been faithful over little, I will set you over much. Enter the joy of your master, Matthew 25, uh, verses 21 and 23. Or will he instead call you a worthless servant and cast you into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth? Matthew 25, 30. There, there's only two destinations. That of the righteous servant or that of the wicked and worthless servant. Which is your destination? What will God say of you? But the difference in the work of those two, student, of those two servants is, is, not, is, is not ultimately in them. The, the, the work of the faithful servant or the lack of work in the wicked servant is not dependent ultimately on works but on faith. For without faith it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11.6 the works of the righteous servant are the fruit of a regenerated heart. Not the root. This is not salvation by works. Without faith in, in the obedience of Christ, in the perfect work of Christ, without turning to Him in repentance and faith, there is no salvation. 
only weeping and gnashing of teeth. Next in verses 4 to 6, we see Joseph's request. After the days of, of mourning again, Joseph acts. He, he goes before, before Pharaoh's household and asks permission to take Jacob's remains to Canaan. And explains his father's request saying, My father made me swear I am about to die in my tomb that I hewed out for myself in the land of Canaan. There you shall bury me. So we see Joseph here acting with wisdom. He makes no mention of the, the request to take him out of Egypt. There's, there's no need to unduly offend Pharaoh. He refers to the, the preparations that, that Jacob had, made, had prepared. He, we, we, we don't read about this in the scriptures, but, but clearly Jacob knew that he was going to die a long time ago when he was still in the land of Canaan. And he hewed out from the rock a, a place in which he would be buried. And then Joseph promises that he's going to return. And now Pharaoh, agree, Pharaoh agrees with this. He agrees that he's not going to lose his, trust, his trustworthy servant because Joseph's been faithful so far. And, and, and he, he, he resonates with the idea of, of preparing for death because in Egypt, many pharaohs spent much of their lives preparing for death. And we have the, the, the pyramids as an ongoing reminder of that fact. An enduring testimony of their, again, misguided, but their preparation for death. One day, if the Lord tarries, you will go into your grave. How have you prepared? What preparations have you made for your death? We make a, a last will and testament, and so we should. We get life insurance, and so we should. We, we give instructions for our funerals, and so we should. We maybe even would, should purchase a burial plot. But, but no amount of pagan preparation is going to suffice. Those things, as important as, as they are, don't even rate compared to the spiritual preparation. Spiritual preparation for, for your own death and, and spiritual preparation for the death of your loved ones. And the way that you prepare for your death and the death of your loved ones is, is only through the gospel as you build your life on the gospel of Jesus Christ, as your life is transformed by the work of the Spirit in your life, as you remember these things, as you preach these truths to yourself, as you, as you preach these things to your loved ones, as you live out the gospel before them, you are preparing them as well as yourself for death. Well, finally, in verses 7 to 14, we see Jacob's funeral procession. Jacob's funeral procession. Now Jacob went up to bury his father. This is Joseph, or Joseph went up to bury his father. This is his first time back in Canaan since his brothers had sold him as a slave over 20 years prior. But Joseph doesn't go up alone. All the servants of Pharaoh go with him. All the elders of Pharaoh's household go with him. All the elders of the land of Egypt go with him. All the brothers of Joseph go with him. All of Joseph's brothers go with him. All of Jacob's household go with him. Only their, their children and flocks and herds were left in the land of Goshen. This, this is an oppressive entourage. This is, this is a kingly funeral procession. The size of this funeral procession reflects Jacob's stature. Now, his burial is quite different from the modest ones of, of Abraham and Isaac. But Egyptian ferry, uh, chariots, chariots are there as well. There, there's a military procession, chariots and, and horsemen. Now, think for a moment about what chariots would represent in the, uh, in the minds of the people who received this as they had after the Exodus. Chariots would have a very different connotation in Israel as Pharaoh's chariots would charge down on them to, to try to decimate them, but were themselves consumed in the Red Sea. The goodwill and the ceremony would disappear under a new Pharaoh, but the memory of this event would serve as an encouragement to the Hebrew slaves who understood their solidarity with Jacob. They understood that Jacob's past was their past, that Jacob's future was their future, that Jacob's God was their God. So as this entourage crossed the Jordan into Canaan, they came to the threshing floor of Atad beyond the Jordan. It seems that they have traveled around the Dead Sea, approaching 
the promised land from the east. And the nation of Israel, as they, after they had received this, had entered Canaan from Egypt in the same direction, carrying the bones of Joseph 440 years later. So once this funeral procession arrives in the Promised Land, they hold a, a seven-day mourning period that commonly described in the Old Testament. That This large funeral procession and the mourning is on display have a powerful effect on the Canaanites who are dwelling there. It's, this is described as a very great and grievous lamentation. So much so that the Canaanites even renamed it because of it. Jacob's sons had been obedient to their father's command. Again, we're reminded of the location here at, at the end of this section. In the land of Canaan, the cave in the field of Machpelah, east of Mamre, where, which Abraham bought from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. And after the burial, burying Jacob, Joseph, his brothers, and all who had gone up to Canaan go back to Egypt. All that is except Jacob. Jacob was home. Now you can still visit this site in Israel. It's under the al Abrahimi Mosque in Hebron. Jacob's remains are still there, along with, with Leah's and Isaac's and Rebekah's and, and Abraham's and Sarah's. The, the remains are there, but none of them are there. None of them are there. One day they will rise with glorified bodies, the, 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 the main part of this promise to Jacob that is yet to be fulfilled. That place in the whole region of the promised land points to something greater. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Hebrews eleven thirteen. Jacob saw with the eyes of faith and he knew that that spot, that that burying place in the land of Canaan, in the physical promised land, wasn't the promised land that he was ultimately looking for. He was looking for a heavenly city. And he saw this with the eyes of faith. John Salehammer points out that the writer's concern focuses on God's faithfulness to his promise of the land and the hope of God's people in an eventual return to the land. In the later prophetic literature, he says, a recurring image of the fulfillment of the promise to return to the land pictures Israel returning to the land accompanied by many from among the nations. He says the prophets of Israel saw the return as a time when all the nations would stream to Jerusalem. Isaiah 2, chapter, verses 2 and 3. So, so do you understand What's Salehammer saying here? He's saying that, that this event, that this funeral procession is a mini exodus foreshadow, foreshadowing the future exodus of Israel. It was a, a type, a type that pointed to a, a greater exodus of the people of Israel out of Egypt into the promised land. And so as the people received this, they did, as they, as they arrived on the outskirts of of the promised land, this, is, this exodus is a journey that they've just taken. They've followed in these footsteps and, and, and now they're about to arrive in the promised land. And so as they arrive 440 years later, they're carrying the bones of Joseph. They understood that, that Jacob's grave was only a claim to the land. That they were about to enter the promised land themselves and they were about to take the promised land for themselves. Just think for a moment about what that an encouragement this must have been to them. That God had been faithful to his promises to Jacob and he had, would be faithful to his promises to them. But of course, that wasn't the ultimate exodus. There's another exodus, a greater exodus, a forthcoming exodus. Our exodus, when many will come from the east and the west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 8, 11. But those who are of Israel in name only will not fare so well. Similarly, those who are Christians in name only will not fare so well. They will have the same destination as those who make no such claim. 
One day, if the Lord tarries, you will make your final journey. What is your destination? Jacob knew that he was going to die. We know we're going to die too if the Lord tarries, but, but so often we don't live life in the light of that fact. So often we live as though this life is all there is. Sometimes we get distracted with the cares of this life. Sometimes we give up hope. What about you? D do you long to go home? Do you long for the kingdom of God? Do you pray to the Lord, your kingdom come? This desire, this longing is, is to a certain extent in the, in the hearts of all of God's people. But it, if it's not there, if you're just living for this life, you, you really need to question your salvation. But maybe you just need to turn and repent of this and, and ask the Lord to fill you with a desire for heaven. A, a desire to enter the, the true and eternal promised land. Jacob knew he was going to die, but he also had the luxury of knowing when. He had lived for 147 years. It was well and truly his time. But death may come suddenly for you. It may come long before you expect it. It may come long before you expect it for you and possibly for your loved ones. Are you prepared? Are they prepared? Jacob's final and greatest journey was to a new life. For the Christian, Jacob's hope for the future is familiar to us and his reliance on God's promises points to our own reliance on God's promises, doesn't it? But we have a better understanding of life beyond the grave than Jacob did. We, we grieve for loved ones who have died, but, but, but we hope for those who have died in Christ. And I was able to share many of these things with, with my friends who were grieving yesterday. But I can't do that for an unbeliever. Death is an enemy. Death entered the world in Genesis 3 when Adam broke the covenant of works. But God almost immediately came through with his promise in Genesis 3.15 that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent, what he himself would have his heel bruised. And all through Genesis, we've seen that, that God's covenants pointed ahead. That God's covenants pointed ahead to the fulfillment of the gospel, the new covenant in Christ Jesus. For he is the one who has crushed the serpent's head and in the process had his heel bruised. When the Samaritans challenged Jesus in John 14, he, he, he spoke of, of being the, the, uh, the, the, of the faith of Abraham, that, that God is not the God of the dead but of the living, that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were not dead but they were living. They are living. To this day, they are living. They are alive eternally with Christ. In John 14, 2 and 3, Jesus promised his disciples, he said, In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. For, that, for where I am, you may also be. We hope for a a new promised land, not, not just a, a physical promised land, but, but the new heavens and the new earth that's promised to, to us in Revelation 21 verses 1 to 4. When the, the first heaven and the first earth have passed away and the sea is no more. When the dwelling place of God is with man. When God will dwell with us and we will be his people, for God himself will be with us as our God. He will wipe away every tear from our eyes, and death will be no more, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, for the former things have passed away. We have the same hope as Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But we understand these things in an infinitely better way because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That ultimately the people who were promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were, were not just one nation, but people from every tribe and tongue and nation. 
And the land that was, was promised to them was not, not one parcel of land in the Middle East, but the new heavens and the new earth. And this is the hope of all, the hope in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we praise you for this gospel. We praise you for this hope that we have in Jesus Christ, who has gone before to prepare a place for us that we will go to be with him forever. This is our hope and this is the hope of all who have died in Christ. We pray that you'd help us all to prepare ourselves for that day by repenting of our sin and putting our faith in you. We pray that, that you'd help us to continue to walk in repentance and that by your grace and for your glory that we would be found among that number when the saints go marching in. Amen.